Hello, everybody. How you doing? Today, we have a very special show. Uh, we have um, Angel Gotti is going to join me with my partner, James Proctor. But we have Frankie Edgar. Yes, that Frankie Edgar, UFC champion uh, and uh, known for his Gray Menard uh, triple uh, uh, that trio of fights that you had. And uh, uh, Frankie has fought no, nobody but the best. And he's I'm taking it. Frankie, you're retired now, right? Yeah, yeah, retired uh, November of uh, of twenty two, and then we ha then we have Kevin Interna Interdonato here, and uh, Kevin, I checked, you were in a lot of. I didn't realize you were uh, on City on the Hill, one of my favorite shows. You were in The Sopranos. You've been in several. Give us a little details of exactly who you are, so uh, so we can tell people why we're doing this interview. Sure, sure. Uh, my name is Kevin Interdonato. Thanks for saying my name right. I appreciate it. And I just want to say something real quick. Frankie says he's retired until somebody pisses him off. I'm only going to hold that like, I'm getting <laughs> Frankie better. I'm only going to hold that so far, man. I, I wouldn't put too much weight on that, man. Yeah. So. If, if Conor McGregor said Frankie can fight, <laughs> Frankie would be like, okay, anywhere you want. <laughs> hey, yeah, my, my, can't can't uh, can't pass that up, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've been an actor for over uh, twenty years. Um, my the bulk of my work has been independent film, done a bunch of TV and stuff, and uh, I am a uh, obsessively, obsessively always trying to find a high as an actor with the best role and the best project. Uh, I've been con consistently. Um, frustrated with roles and where the productions usually end up, especially in independent film, you have no control over that. So several years I learned how to make films as well, started writing, started producing, and then Bastard Sons, uh, I wrote it and I got so attached to it. I said, I just, I think I got to direct this. So I jumped in and somehow or another, we got picked up by Vertical Entertainment, which is one of the biggest um, distributors in Hollywood and the movie's popping and it's just been a crazy ride. And wow. uh, Angel, is there anything that you would like to ask uh, either one of them? Um, <clears throat> well, I said before that uh, it was nice to see Kevin smile because um, he didn't smile the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> but it really is nice to see you smile. I loved the movie and I don't like those kind of movies, but that movie I really did. The, I think it was the the ending that did it for me. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of that. Yeah, the ending <laughs> did it for me. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, I, yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't tell anybody, but it I, was yeah, good. Don't, it, don't tell anyone there. It was it was uh, shocking. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's funny when you're writing the script that that was not in the first draft or the second draft or the third draft, but you just. You keep digging, digging, digging and playing around ideas in your head. You could be driving, playing with my kid. Then all this stuff just kind of comes into my mind. And then uh, I think that that aspect popped popped into my head about a month before we were filming. Uh, maybe a month and a half before, you know, um, I sent an updated draft to everybody. And I said, I know how to put a cherry on this cake. And it just it just worked. So it I'm glad. Did. Thanks. It did. It really did. And Kevin, how did you, so Frankie, Kevin, how did you guys hook up? How did you meet? How long have you known each other? Why don't you guys tell us, uh, Frankie, why don't you start telling us how, how you uh, met Kevin and uh, got into this? Well, Kevin, we're both from, uh, you know, uh, Jersey, uh, not too far apart from each other. Uh, I grew up similar, similar ways, I'd say, uh, but we got connected um, about a year and a, a bit, a year before the project started. Uh, I actually do a podcast called Champ and a Tramp with the, uh, Roger Matthews, we had Kevin on as a guest, um, you know, just talk about his film career and, you know, his, his time uh, served over in the military. And then a couple of weeks later, maybe a month later, he hit us up and asked us if we wanted to, you know, do a, a small role in his, his film, his upcoming film that he has. And we both said yes. And then I think a couple of weeks after that, he said, hey, there's a, a different role that opened up. Would you want to jump in it? And um, I was like, yeah, let's do it. And uh, that's kind of how it, how it all started. And uh I'm thankful for for the opportunity from from Kevin because uh, I had an absolute blast doing this film. Uh, you know, I, I have a very little bit of, uh, of experience in in this industry, so to be able to jump in with these guys has been tremendous. James, James, oh, I'm sorry, Kevin. You want to add on to that? Uh, 
No, nah, Frankie pretty much summed it up. Yeah, we grew up close to each other, never knew each other. Might, might have seen each other at a bar here and there you know, back in, in Seaside, but um, our dads are both kind of contractors, you know, know some of the same people, all that stuff. So, yeah, we just kind of hit it off, you know, and um, the the movie is cast with um, with very experienced actors, veterans that have been around for a long time, like Malik Whitfield. He's been yep. um, that big movie, Five Heartbeats, and... It's just so many big films and TV shows yeah. and Alex Sapienza, who is yeah. Mikey Palmis and the Sopranos. And then the complete opposite, people that never been on camera before yet. Um, my dad's in the movie, you know, my dad's buddies in the movie. My buddies I grew up with in the Howler in the movies. Frankie never really acted before. Roger. So there's, it's literally most of the cast in the support, almost all the supporting roles are non-actors. And I, I knew that was the only way to capture the realism of the piece. So with Frank, he's been in the spotlight for so long, for good reason. Um, he's been on camera for a long time too. You know, people don't realize that. Like for me, I, I get nervous in front of crowds or things. I can't imagine Frankie being on TV with millions of people watching and all the people in the crowd. And, and he's just completely comfortable in himself talking after a fight or even on his podcast or interviews. That means something to me. Because there's a lot of actors, even though, you know, you train and train and whatnot, everyone has different paths of what they think an actor should be or their goals as an actor. The goal to me is to not act at all. So if you get someone that doesn't know how to act and they're just comfortable already that, you know, and, and are just OK being themselves and not put on an act when the when someone says action, that was what I needed. And uh you know, Frankie falls under that category. He's just, uh, he's just a, a confident guy and he's comfortable with himself and um, he's got a great presence. I was like, this is going to work. And he looks good holding a baseball bat doing his thing. So, <laughs> yeah, we don't want to give that away, but, but that, that was a fun part. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Curious. Uh, James, is, I'm sorry, James, is there anything you want to ask before Angel jumps in? Yeah, yeah, just a couple of things about, about this. So one is, the, you know, like I said, this was, a very good movie, great movie, you know, and what was refreshing to me is seeing the, the writing, qual the quality of the story was, was great. And, and that's something that we're missing today, in my opinion, and it doesn't matter if it's independent or non-independent, we just don't see the, the quality of writing, you know, and there's a lot of great actors out there, but to me, it's always the, uh, the writing and the story that's most important. And that's what I thought that, you definitely got right, and then you found uh, actors and and people to be able to play the the parts appropriately, and so that's what was impressive to me. And then, uh, you know, obviously now the whole distribution model of uh, movies is is changed, and so it's what's on, uh, it's on its ear, yeah, yeah. So what's independent mean to people? So people need, yeah. You know, I just wonder you may explain that because people don't. They hear independent, then there's the big studios, but what does that really mean to to the consumer? I, I'd love to explain that. I love talking yeah. business. Um, yeah. he's, the, he's, the, he's the smart one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, I don't I don't like talking art too much. Uh, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, mostly because I don't like how it sounds and it comes out of other people's mouths, so I just keep my mouth shut about that stuff. It's, it's personal and, and it, it is what it is, but business, yeah. So uh, before I get into that, James, great question. I, I'm I'm blown away and surprised. I don't take this the wrong way that someone that anyone in Texas likes the movie. You know, when you're writing or making something, you don't know who's going to respond. You know, see, um, I'm from I, I'm from I'm from New York. I'm a New Yorker. Brooklyn, right, right, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. But even Yonkers like, and, and Brooklyn, I grew up in. There you go. <laughs> I'm as New York like, as you could be. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> so it's it's a great feeling knowing that it, it this the the movie translates regardless of the genre regardless exactly of that it was it's really good to know so th thanks man so here's sure. what's up with um independent film independent film has changed and i'll make this as succinct as possible guys independent film has been around for a long time people don't realize it but clint eastwood warren Beatty, these guys have been making independent films since the beginning all those spaghetti westerns were indies yeah. Independent film means one thing. It means your movie is not financed and created by a studio. That's it. 
And since there's been a surge of independent films in more recent years, especially in the 90s, because it became easier to make a movie when digital cameras started coming out. So you don't need all this big, oh, you don't need all this big money or big crew. So people started making movies like crazy. In the 90s, independent feel, film actually had like a, a feel to it. It was very gritty. It, it's, it's, it's what I came up with when I started. That has since changed because independent film used to have a connotation. Be like, oh, it's an indie. You, you, you made the movie for $20, $20 and a bag of chips, you know? But now independent films to date, I mean, they could be fun. They could be a hundred million dollars. So it's really just what's funded by the studio or created by the studio or completely independent. And nowadays completely independent means the more of an entrepreneurial mind you have as a producer making the film puts you on a different tier than before because of the, the way the business has went. I made a film a few years back. It was called Bad Frank and it popped. We actually shot it in Jersey. I was living in LA at the time. Um, Tom Sizemore was in it. He was freaking incredible, man. My wife um, and some other people. Ray uh, Boom Boom Mancini is a friend of mine. He was in it. He jumped in, played my dad. So I knew when this movie was coming out, the times were changing because when it came out on Amazon, iTunes and all that, they literally put the movie right between Transformers and something else. Like for new releases at the time. So I'm like, holy shit. This is, this, is, this is the world we live in now. I don't have to go to a big movie theater across the country because when people see it on the TV, no one knows the difference, studio to indie. It's just a movie. So with that, you have to hope that that movie is as good as what it's around. That's independent film. And, That's it. And the streaming, yeah. the street, does it make it easier to get your movies out now with all yes. the streaming services? Yes, the difference is there's so many movies. There's 7,000, 8,000 movies made a year. Mm, yeah. There's that many worldwide made a year. You'll only know about 100 of them, 150 that come out every year. That's how bad some movies are. And, and that's how tough it is to get them known. You know, there may be another 200, 300 movies that are like just outstanding film, being in the business that I know about because I'm connected to that independent world that a common movie goer would never know about. So when I was saying yeah. before, you have to have an entrepreneurial mind, you have to be the marketer, you have to be the producer, you have to be the casting director, you have to be everything and think as good as they are, they do. And if you don't, you have to know enough to hire someone to fill that position. So we yeah, could have, yeah. with sons that, um, I don't know, man, something happened. It's kind of like lightning in a bottle. I, I wasn't expecting all this. <laughs> It's pretty, uh, okay. Even the dog likes it. See, like everyone <laughs> likes the movie, uh, but it's been pretty wild. Frankie, you know I want to ask Frankie. Mind? I'm sorry. I want to just ask Frankie one quick thing. Frankie, now you, uh, let's face it, uh, up here you're the most well known. I mean, you've been shouted out by Joe Rogan. You get shouted out by Joe Rogan. End of story. So, uh, when you when you got involved in this, did you consider yourself like I'm the most well person known person in this movie? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, the most inexperienced person in that movie. That's kind of how I post it. Um, I'm not. I'm not one to you know stroke myself at all. So uh, I kind of just think me and Kev are on the same par. Uh, if anything, I'm. I'm. You know, looking up to those guys. Those are the guys that are. Uh, you know, in in this industry, um, helping me out, showing me the ropes. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of, I had a white belt mentality going into this. If you know what I mean. Sure. And. James, you wanted to ask something? No, no. It was a follow-up on the independent thing. Um, so uh, one of the things that's fascinating to me was how you raise money, how you come up with the funding of it. And uh, there was actually a crowdsourcing way of, of doing this. There was a, a show called The Chosen. It's a series. And uh, this was a, about a, is a religious thing. But those guys is a guy named Dallas Jenkins. They raised millions of dollars for that production. Of course, it was a series and it's still on. It's not a movie. But uh, what do you think of the way that some of these um, people are able to raise money through crowdsourcing? And, and is that something that maybe you did when you were uh, uh, coming up with this idea? You know, because obviously the financing aspect of it it's not cheap to do a movie even yeah. with technology so how did you deal with that and what's your thoughts on crowdsourcing 
Oh man, when, once you started talking, the wheels are just going. That's a that's a big question. I'll try to answer yeah. as best I can. I did the crowdsourcing thing several years ago. I couldn't stand yeah. up and do it again. Mm. I don't like I don't like asking people for things. Yeah, I just don't. Uh, works for some people, not my bag. So be it. This was I. I, I come from a family construction business, small, you know, blue collar. And I watched my dad through the years and, and worked with him through the years. And I know what it takes to have your own business. So every movie has its own LLC. Every movie essentially is a business. If you're going to start a business, you got to know how you're going to make money. I'm in a business of dreamers. You know, I don't, I don't listen to that quote. Where people say like, follow your dreams. I think that's bullshit. I think you let your dreams inspire you, but if you follow your dreams and don't have a business sense, you're screwed, you know? Mm. So you can follow them all the way to the bank when you're declaring bankruptcy. Um, for me doing Bastard Sons, it was the first time that I was wearing a director hat. So I'm not, I wasn't proven. I didn't know how I would do it, man. It was just kind of a shot in the dark. I never, I never read a directing book. I never directed anything. I never read a writing book. So I bet on myself. And so did my wife. And by the way, uh, Lee, my wife is Kathy Ryan on City on a Hill. I'll get back to that later. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, hmm. So um, for me doing Bastard Sons, I didn't want to put anyone in a position to take a risk if I was not proven making a movie yet in that capacity. I produced, but I have not directed yet. So I took the risk. Just like someone's going to open up a pizza shop, you know, and they never made pizza before, but they just love pizza and they, they convince people that they're going to, you know, make the best pie and make lots of money. You know, they're going to take money from other people or they're going to do it out of their own pocket. Well, this is a business, too. So my wife and I gambled, bet on ourselves. We financed about 90 percent of it. One of my buddies I grew up with threw me a couple bucks. My old army recruiter from the National Guard out of Tom's River threw me a couple bucks and we got this movie made. And I wanted to gamble on myself first to prove that, um, to myself, not to any, any naysayers, that I could do it. I could make a, a good film that people enjoy. And that's very, very important to me creatively, but also on the business side of thing. It's almost like a metaphor with these fucking color, the walls behind me. It's like, I got these two sides that I gotta, I gotta satisfy, you know? So financially, <laughs> yes, I need, I need this movie for my family for potential business and other films I now have lined up to show that I can make money on a movie and have a successful um, uh, business plan, a business model. So we'll know soon, you know, if that works yeah. out, if it's- And what I like to say, Frankie, when you hear this, okay, so you're, you're becoming a fighter, right? And you never, you probably never realized you were gonna become a famous fighter. And, so Kevin's talking about this. Would you put it in the same grounds where as you, you, you know, you're, you're trying to become something and then you become something and now you're entering another phase of your life? I mean, uh, do you think this is going to be a tougher challenge than, for you than fighting was? Uh, I mean, yeah, 100 um, percent. You know, fighting. I, I grew up fighting. I, I grew up wrestling. Um, that, that's all I really know. <laughs> this is. This is definitely, uh, you know, very foreign to me. Um, I never was the artsy type of kid and stuff like that, but uh, it, it's exciting. Uh, I'm, I really enjoyed it, and, uh, you know, I'm excited to see if anything can come from this. Uh, and maybe even if it's just the sequel, I'm, I'm all in. <laughs> well, I, I was talking to a Tommy Stiggs. He has a show on here, a very pleasant show, and uh, he knows who you are because you were Tom, Tom's River. His son wrestled in Tom's River, and uh, – the minute I mentioned your name, he wasn't even thinking about you as a UFC fighter. He was thinking about you as that high school wrestler. Yeah, yeah. Which, I've been and, out of four minutes. Just, yeah, he was just telling me, and I didn't realize that you had this successful of a, you were a very successful high school wrestler. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of where it all started. Uh, you know, wrestling in high school, uh, competing, you know, with, with all all these Jersey guys, and then then I went to school in Pennsylvania for college, and came home, started working as a plumber, and, and started training as a fighter, and Fight and took off, and that's kind of what led me to, to the UFC. Frankie was like, fuck plumbing, man. I'm going to yeah. go. <laughs> that's for sure. And yeah, how, many how, many years, how many years have you been wrestling? Well, I, I was been wrestling since I was 13, but I was, I was oh. in the UFC. I was in the UFC. I meant, I meant the UFC. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah no, I was in the UFC uh, from 2007 to 22, so 15 years. Wow. 
It's a long time. Wow. Which is a very, uh, which is, uh, it is very, very, you do not hear about that. 15 years. Very oh, few yeah. fighters last 15 years. Exactly. But not only that, it's like I said, not only were you in the UFC for 15 years, every fight you had was against him. I mean, you fought Yari Rodriguez and now he's a star and, and you know, you, you, you and I, I forgot you fought Yari Rodriguez and you didn't fight him in your prime. Yeah, I mean, I was a little older, you know. I, I was a little older, but yeah, that, that definitely not during my title run and stuff like that. Yeah, I fought. Well, I fought three different weight classes too, so yeah. I got to fight the best of the best in three different weight classes. Um, yeah, you know, I, I put a lot into into the sport, and uh, it was uh, it was an amazing experience. I got to live a movie, you know. I really did. I got to live a movie. Uh, you know, that I used to grow up on Rocky movies and 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 kickboxer and blood sport, all this type of stuff, and I kind of got to I got to live in real life. I'm going to ask you, know you a what? question, the, and then we'll sorry. get back to the movie. I want to ask you one more UFC question, because you know what? i got to be able to turn this into short. Yeah, and I have a, a <laughs> UFC as <laughs> well, Lee. <laughs> okay, okay. No problem, yeah. James. So, here's my question about uh, UFC. You fought the best of the best. Who gave you – Who is there anybody you feared to get in, the, in, in that ring with, and who do you think was the best fighter you ever fought? Um, I never feared anybody. I never went to a fight thinking I wasn't going to win. I didn't win them all, but I never walked into a fight thinking I was going to lose. Um, it's tough to really say who was the best. I'll give you like top top four, we'll say. Like BJ okay. Penn, I, I beat him three times, but when I fought him, he was uh, he was like unbeatable. He you know he had he had an aura about him. So preparing for him was definitely a big big mountain to climb. You know for the first time, and uh, so I always say BJ Penn, Jose Aldo. I fought him twice. I never beat him. Um, one of the craftiest dudes. I mean, one, one of our fights was, you know, a little controversial. Could, maybe could have went my way. Uh, and then I'll say Max Holloway. He was another another really, really good champion that I fought. Um, and I guess you go Benson Henderson. You know, he, I lost my title to him at 55. Uh, again, controversial fights, but uh, really good, really good opponents. Frankie, who had the best hands? Uh, the best hands? I mean, I, I know Al, Aldo, Max Holloway had really good hands. I, I think uh, the hardest punch, though, was was the hardest punch I've been hit was probably Maynard. Maynard hit me with the biggest shot. Do you, after you go through a series of three fights with a guy like Maynard, do you like feel attached to him for? I mean, there's these series of fights where people have two, three fights, wars. It be, do you feel attached to that person? Is there an attachment there that's going to always be there? You know, we'll be intertwined in, in the history books forever. So, yeah, for sure. You, you, you know, you share, you share that much blood and sweat in a cage. Uh, you definitely share something, you know, uh, uh, special. Um, you know, I see all these. I, I'm, I'm friendly with everybody I fought. I have no bad blood with nobody. I'll see these guys and we'll, you know, have a beer or whatnot. So, you yeah, know, you definitely share something with these guys when, when, when you go to war like that. Okay, James, I'm sorry. No, no, that, that that's really good. You know, in a couple of, couple of things to, to me that, Oh, well, one question, one comment, but the comment one, I think one of the most impressive things is that there was a, I saw this as a record that you have the second longest total fight time in UFC history, almost eight hours in the, you know, in the ring. And, and I, I mean, that's amazing to me, the endurance, the ability just to, just to come back and continue to fight. Because people don't realize that you have a lot of people that their careers are two or three fights or five, you know, and so what you've been able to do over a period of time is just impressive. And then uh, I just wanted to ask about your martial arts. Uh, you know, I know you did wrestling starting off. But I believe that you were also with uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. So when did you learn the martial arts? And because you actually, you know, you achieved a lot there just in martial arts. Yeah, well, well, yeah. Thank you for for, for the nice words. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I did. I, I consider wrestling a martial art. So that was my first martial art, obviously yes. at thirteen yes. years old. Uh, but Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is such a big part of the UFC. Obviously, Hoist Gracie, the guy that you know brought the UFC to the forefront, is is a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practitioner. And uh, I'm a third degree black belt on the Ricardo Almeida. Uh, I've been training Jiu Jitsu pretty much since I started fighting. So uh, that's just such a big part. And then I have a really good boxing coach, Mark Henry. Uh, he started, we started, he, I was the first guy he trained and uh, he's yeah, trained multiple yeah. champions since then. So yeah, I, I had a really good team around me. Um, I have good Muay Thai coaches. You know, that's what, that's what's great about the UFC. You have to, uh, 
you got to be good at, you know, many different sports. You'll be very well-rounded, especially in today's game. That's why I think, you know, I was able to last 15 years because I constantly kept working on my craft, constantly tried being well-rounded, you know, didn't really get too complacent. You get complacent, you get left behind. So, uh, luckily, I have a great team around me. And, Frank, do you find – I'm sorry, Angel, go. I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask him, how how did your family feel about you doing this? Well, when I my first, nephew <laughs> does this and I hate it. I hate it. I can't yeah, even well, watch him. My uh yeah, my mother and my, my wife or well, fiance back then, they were definitely not too too happy about it. Um, you know, I, I just graduated college and I was in the plumbing union, you know, like what are you you know, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And I, they knew what they knew I wasn't gonna stop, so they decided to you know support me. You know, it, it took a little, it took a little while, but uh, you know, once once they realized that uh, I was all in on it and they weren't gonna stop me, they they supported me. And did they watch your fights? My wife watched all of them. Uh, my mother, she would go to the bathroom whenever I. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. I go inside. Yeah. I go inside and pray. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly what my mother does. <laughs> and Frankie and Kevin, I would like to ask you both to tell us what your heritage heritage is. If you're Italian, it doesn't matter. But I'd just like to get that because Angel said something very interesting. I told her that uh, I, I mentioned your name to her and she goes, that's not an Italian name. So, mm -hmm. Frankie. <laughs> Uh yeah yeah uh yeah I'm uh, I'm mostly Italian. Well, according to Twenty Three and Me, I'm seventy percent Italian. Uh, I, I, I used I used to think I was twenty percent German, but I, I'm not. I guess the rest I'm like a little English, a little a little Irish. I got a little little Iranian in me too, but uh, mostly Italian. My, my my mother's side is from Italy. My mom was the first first one born in America from from that side of the family. Uh, and my father's side, he, my father was half Italian, but my stepfather. They're, they're, he's all Italian too. So, you know, grew up with a, I grew up in Italian. I, mean, I think if you're from Jersey, um, <laughs> you got a little bit of Italian in you no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Kevin? Yeah, I, I, I always knew I, I was, but it wasn't until I did the, um, ancestry is like the 23 and me, right, Frank? That's like, yeah, yeah, same stuff. I did that. You have to spit in a little tube and send it in. And, um, they said it was 94% Sicilian. Um, all my roots, my great grandparents are. I'm like fourth generation over here, you know. But uh, my family kept it real. I'm the first one to marry a, a blonde haired, blue eyed girl. So I broke the mold. So I call my daughter. I uh, I call my daughter my little Sicilian Viking. Did you ever go to Sicily? Yeah, too briefly though, Angel. I, I can't yeah, me to too. I went. I, I went. Can't wait. It felt that I felt at home there. Oddly enough, we we did a big tour. Went from you know northern Italy all the way down. Northern Italy, everyone's kind of frail, I guess, thin and whatnot. Yeah. As you go down, yeah. you know, everyone looks like they're from North Jersey. As you go down, 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 and, and uh, the diets just, change. They put start using the cream sauce. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, people don't realize that Italy is has two different. You know, it's split down the middle. The diets are. Very vastly different, and uh, you know the Sicilians there. I was surprised. So I got the I got this on my arm when I was there, and that's on the Sicilian flag. And, oh uh, yes, it is. Wow. The dude that, my tattoo artist, he, uh, I mean, he looked like a Viking. Big blonde beard, piercing blue eyes, full blooded Sicilian. And they say, he even said, he's like, uh, he said, we're not Italian. He's like, we're, we're not Italian. We're Sicilian. They're very proud of that. Yes, they are. So Kevin did did. Frankie ever talk you to get in the ring with him and wrestle and toss around a little bit? If he did, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin's got some wrestling, some little boxing in his background too. Don't let him fool you. Nah, I, I, I always said, if I'm, you're going to get your butt kicked, you might as well get it kicked by someone that knows what they're doing. <laughs> when we did the movie, uh, you know, Frankie, Frankie and I hit it off. We met and then, you know, you get to know each other more. And there's a few times in the movie, um, well, directing them. I, I, I get passionate, you know what I mean? So I'm bopping around this and that. And I had a, I'm like, I think, I forget what it was, Frank, but I was holding Frankie. I'm like, you know, Frank, you're going to turn like this and move here. And I kept saying, I was like, don't hit me, dude. I said, don't, <laughs> don't hit me. Like, okay, uh, no, Frankie, think about it, man. These guys, you know, fr Frankie's one of the toughest people in the world. Like, isn't that crazy? Nice. And they, they train, yeah. This is what they do for a living. I don't do this for a living. So if he got uh, you. If he got you in that neck lock that you got in, in the movie, you're going to sleep. 
<laughs> now let me ask you who who what part did your father play ah um my father and most of my buddies um it was the opening scene when i walked into the uh yes okay. all, all the guys in there yes yes those all of my boys i grew up with and my dad my dad was the bald guy that when everyone came up to greet me and he didn't say anything and i said dennis yeah that's, okay that's your dad wow his name's dennis. yeah i said dad just don't say nothing to me just look at me and walk away so, right. so, so that's wow yeah. And Angel, you had another question you wanted to ask him about the name of the movie. Yes. Now, is the 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 name the title of the movie that's going to stay the same? Yeah. And when we dealt with the distributor, you know, there's a lot of Yeah, I know. Shit, that's why I'm asking you know? that question. Yeah. There's a lot of shit. You gotta you yeah. gotta give and take. And and um when you when you put all of yourself into something, it's it's kind of hard to give. But to make a deal, you do what you gotta do. So they've been good. They one of the one of the uh, things I had the biggest hang up was it wasn't the negotiations, the money and all that stuff. It was the title. I and they it. said we need to reserve the right to change the title. And I was like, over my dead body, man. I said, it's, what are you going to call it? Because they have the tendency to to make things sellable rather than. Yes. Yes. And I said, you can't change the title. But then they said we need we have to reserve that right just in case. When we go to platforms, platforms don't want to put that name up. So I had to give that right. I'm like, all right, I just kind of crossed my fingers. And I said, well, I guess I, I got to, you know, I can't say no. What are we not going to be on a certain platform? So thankfully, you know, people have a problem with bastards. Frank and I was on, we we're on Good Day New York last week. And um, the, the woman that interviewed us was a great gal, but uh, someone told us she didn't want to say the name of the movie because she didn't want to say bastards. So everyone's oh. got their own, their own take on things. So it is what it is, you know. Did she did not she, say it? Did she say it? I think she did. I think she said it. She oh, did? she did. Okay. Yeah, when Frankie so. walks in, she's probably like, <laughs> "Yeah." I'm like, "Say it." Say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a feeling. I actually call. I said, uh, "I wonder if they're gonna have a problem with the. Uh, if they're gonna have to change the title of the movie." Yeah, so far so good. Four oh, and good. Six, you know, four good. and they do whatever they want. But uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but Angel Gotti's family is an is in the entertainment business, and they have dealt with movie uh, uh, production and all that stuff. And yeah. uh, that's one of the reasons I'm glad she's here because Angel has a line. She goes, "I'm not about the mob." And I said, "Angel, you're Angel Gotti. It doesn't matter whether you're about the mob or not." As no, but I'm not about it at all. But that's why I, I don't even use. like movies or shows about it. I don't I don't watch them. But what this show? movie was different. This was uh the, this this movie was different. This was violent. I don't really like violent movies either, but this one kept my interest and and then the ending is like wow. Yeah. I loved it. I have to say I really loved it. I told that's Marla nice. You know, I said, Marla, watch it. It's it. I, it's a, shockingly, I really, really liked it. <laughs> wow, thanks. That's really she's nice. Not, you know, she's we, not going to say screened, that. <laughs> uh, we screened in a, a film festival. We got invited to screen at a film festival um, in Southern Jersey. I didn't promote it online. Um, we just, I just want because we never, it never went public yet. So Frankie was there. Roger, uh, who's Frank? Roger Matthews does the. Um, the podcast with Frank, who's also in the movie, he played big because he's just uh -huh. big. Um, and we all went there and that was a mixed crowd. Remember Frank, there was like people, men yeah. with all ages and um, it, 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 it conveyed well. And I was blown away that there was some older ladies there and they loved it. And I was like, wow, because you make a movie thinking of your target audience. You don't think how it's going to convey. So I'm glad you liked it, Angel. That's That means a lot. No, I really did. And uh, and I even told Lee Cole, I said, you see, if I didn't like it, if I didn't like the movie, I wouldn't have made, I wouldn't be here right now. I would have said to Lee Cole, listen, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> 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 no you do it i'll pass on this one but i really did like it uh, i liked it a lot i'm glad that's cool thank awesome. you james yeah so the hopefully i'm not on mute am i no you're not okay so no, you're not yeah so the yeah 
the movie again that you know is really um you know to me you know it was the writing that that did it great story and everything and so when you went into it was there a the technicalities of it were you saying that this is going to be a, a a certain length and then also what what are you doing about the distribution i know amazon prime is going to um show it or have it on their platform i'm sure there's multiple uh platforms and so will this eventually also get into a a cinema as well so i'm just kind of curious about the distribution model and and how you also came up with the length of the if the movie, if that was, because I thought it was the, the link was perfect for what you, uh, the story. Oh, wow. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, to answer the distribution model, it's actually in theaters right now. It's in Brooklyn, Chicago, Minneapolis, Dallas, and Detroit for a week. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So when any film gets a theatrical release, cause you know, the, like we were talking before, the models changed. So they call it a limited theatrical. Back in the day, they would do a limited theatrical for a hundred theaters or 50 or then 20. Now it's five. Um, so they just kind of do it to get the word out there. And, and when you go theatrical, it helps bump up on the VOD platforms a little bit. So Vertical gave us a bump. Um, regarding the uh, the length, you know, it's funny. I, I wrote several screenplays before and directing this one, most screenplays you look at it and, and rule of, Rule of the business is it's a, a minute a page. <clears throat> Excuse me. So most screenplays are 90 pages or over or a little under, you know. Sons was uh, 65. And people were a little nervous about that. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't nervous about it too, but I just had a, you know, it's one of those moments where you feel so strongly about something. I said, I got to bet on myself. I know it's going to be a minute. I know it's going to be an hour and a half because it could say on the page, um, you know, Donnie Mac runs down the street. And it's one simple line, it reads that fast. But in my mind, I'm like, all right, Donnie's gonna run down the street, we're gonna get the camera low and pan up like this. He's gonna trip and fall, pick up his gun, start running again, have the camera behind him, look back. So in my mind, that's like a minute and a half, whereas it reads literally in five seconds. So I wasn't right. concerned about that because I wasn't trying to sell it. When people try to sell screenplays, you wanna like, you know, put it within the parameters of selling. But I was making it for what was in my head, and I just kind of knew it was going to be that long. We didn't, um, we didn't cut anything. Every single thing we shot, we used. There was actually a little bit more dialogue in one scene that was cut because the scene was running long, and it was the phone call between Darius when he was in the alleyway and myself and the character Dobson in the car. And you know, in movies, you find out about a character by what other people say and how other people react about them. So specifically that kind of, the extra stuff in that conversation was about Donnie. Uh, and there was something about, he was, you know, how's Donnie been? And I think Darius said, oh, he's down in AC again. We haven't talked to him in a couple of days and something wrong was just Donnie being Donnie. So right there from the beginning of the movie, it was like, all right, I want to set the tone for Donnie's character without him having to do anything. Um, but the scene was just running long, just chiseled it down. But, I, but I'm pretty sure from what Frankie did on screen and how it conveyed, you can kind of tell he's a little, little wild. You know what I mean? He's that guy. He's got a bottle in the tub smoking a cigarette. It's like, okay, I, we kind of pick up who he is without just throwing it in your face. And you hope that an audience picks up on things. Mm -hmm. And and I, I I think they have. Yeah. And, yeah, and Frank, Frank, yeah. I'm going to ask Frankie a question about social media. Frankie, when you started this, uh, your career, basically it was in the, it was in the beginning of social media. And now you're leaving your career and you're entering social media. I see that you have a podcast. You could tell us a little bit about that. Um, but do you find that, you know, a lot of people don't realize how difficult social media is when you come in here. Uh, so what is your plan for your show? And are you going to do a couple shows a week? Uh, uh, and why don't you just take it from there? Yeah, no, well, you know, we've actually been... Uh we've been doing the champion and tramp for four years now. Uh, we have over 200, 200 episodes. We're on pretty much everywhere. Podcasts are, are, are available. Uh, you know, we're just me and my buddy, Roger Matthews. He's from uh, Jersey shore fame. He's Jay Wow's ex ex husband. And uh, I've known him for a long time, even before his Jersey shore fame. And uh, we just, 
I, I came up with the idea to, hey, let's do a podcast. You know, he comes from a different different walk of life than myself, but, you know, kind of have some good synergy. And, um, yeah, we kind of just sit in my basement once a week, bullshit, talk about current events, talk shit on each other. You know, it's, it's all fun. It's kind of really light. And, uh, yeah, you know, we, we, it's not um, – it's not the biggest money maker, I'd say, but hey, you know, it's a slow grow, it's a slow grow. But uh, it, I have fun. It's in my basement, hanging out with my buddy. We have guests you now. Obviously, uh, it led to me to be into this in this movie. Let me meet Kevin, uh, some other, you know, good people. So all in all, it's something I enjoy doing, and uh, you know, I'll keep doing it as long as it makes sense. And I like to say to people that are watching this, I'm gonna uh, add to your link to this underneath here. Any information, including the movie, the movie links, and your trailers, I'll make sure that's all down there, too. Angel will do it, too. And uh, James uh, will help me do it. And um, I, I I, watched your – you come – you know what? You're presented as, like, when you're in the ring, as, like, this shy fighter. You know, not not loud. Like, mm -hmm. like, like Sean Strickland, loud. You know what I right. mean? Right. And we've entered a new phase. I mean, now fight, fighters, now the social media is getting so bad that people are saying very nasty things to each other. I mean, we've seen this in the last month, two fighters in, in particular. Mm -hmm. And does that bother you that it's gotten so ugly, the UFC and nasty, or in MMA in general? It's, it's when you start talking about people's fathers, mothers, and people being dead, I mean... And, it's, yeah. and it seems like it's going to get worse. Yeah, well, you know, it's the Conor McGregor effect. He came in here, you know, outlandish, loud, you know, talking junk. But he, like I said, he had char a little bit of charm to himself. He was funny. He was pretty pretty witty. Uh, he didn't cross the line too many times, as of late kind of has. Uh, but a lot of these fighters, like you said, are, 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 you know, attacking religion, attacking family. To me, that's off limits. Um that's how I always played it. And, you know, if someone said that stuff to me, I'd probably smack them in their face and in real life, you know? So that's why I don't, I don't talk that kind of stuff on, on social media. And I was the type of guy that just let my fight and do the talking. You know, I was raised, my, you know, my old man said to me, you always got to worry about the quiet guy. That's the guy you got to worry about. I always took yeah. that to heart. So that's kind of how I went yep. about, about my life. And, just like um, YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. YouTube you know? tax family, that pit, dead family members and uh mothers daughters sisters they're disgusting yeah it's like uh shock shock value and uh it's mm -hmm. not my type of style and kevin w why did you choose to make a movie about crime i mean are you fascinated with that life are you fascinated say with the uh, mob genre or are watching the id channel i mean what what some people are just very fascinating with the with with crime. Uh, a lot of people, it's kind of a fantasy. They can be something, but they never can be it. So is it, so. What do you think about that? Oh, yeah, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but I'm, I'm fascinated with 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 all human behavior. You know, a movie is um, a movie is supposed to d depict. A highlight in in someone's life or just a high point in life you know it's funny you, you know you think about like videos that get more views on social media and youtube i think it's a very telling factor of how people view cinema because you know it could be you could go see a fight on youtube in the street or something and it gets 25 million views but if you see someone helping someone on the street who gives a shit people like drama they like conflict i i'm obsessed with those moments of any kind putting someone in a situation that they don't know no one knows what's going to happen um i kind of i don't know i kind of like when that happens to me i like getting shocked because like life gets mundane so it's not so much crime but i guess when i write my my mind just kind of goes there you know i grew up with with tough guys i grew up you know the underbelly of the, of the construction world you know the, the the scrape in the bottom of the barrel you know my dad used to pick up dudes to go to work in the morning from their house with like needles in their arm and who was who was an alcohol like hardcore drinking on the job like all these guys i grew up with in my and out of my life like for years at a young age and i always there was something about it i always gravitated to so as an actor i like playing roles like that and as a as a writer 
I don't even know if I'm a filmmaker yet. I only direct the one movie, so I don't even know what, what I am. But um, uh, I, I, I can't really look outside my own world writing a narrative because I see myself going through these obstacles. So that's why I don't know if I'm that good of a writer because I know writers and writers write every day and they write these worlds. The only world I write is the world that I know. I'm not gonna go write a sci-fi or a fiction or post-apocalyptic or this romantic comedy. Um, it's just not what I know. So organically, it just kind of comes out of me. And I think it kind of lends to, I don't know, I, yeah, maybe I'm going full circle here and talking myself in a bubble. Yeah, I like crime, Lee. Yeah. I, I, uh... <laughs> well, 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 I, I got to ask you that question because it's kind of funny because James and I talked about this uh, when Sammy Gravano's son punched me in the temple. Oh, my God. My show, my show doubled in size within oh a couple Oh, my years. God. And, and 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 that's and that's what happens. I mean, yeah. you just hit it right on the spot. People like to watch that kind of stuff. That if, Sam, it. if Sammy or his son, you know, uh, off camera, you told them you were hard up for money, and they give you a hundred dollar bill, who give a shit? Nobody. But the fact that there was some kind of conflict there, it's gravitating, you know. So putting people in real people, say to bastard sons, for example. You know, they're not, you want to call them gangsters? Go ahead. I didn't write gangster. They're just in a, they're, they, they're criminals. And and um, this is the life they they live. So to put any kind of person in a heightened circumstance, because Bastard Sons only takes place over two days, if you think about it. It's right. only two days. So to put put any kind of person, whether they're a criminal or or a postal worker, in a heightened circumstance and see what happens, it's bravery of an actor to want to go through that and experience it at the highest level without any inhibitions. And I think when people are going through that and not acting through it, willingly giving themselves to that moment, that's why people, like you were saying, like to see violence on YouTube or something like that, because you're witnessing it first time. And so is the actor when they're going through it. Right. On film. So to me, that's, that's, that's interesting, you know? And James, is there anything you want to say to that? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I agree with that uh, 100%, you know. And then also, the thing is that when you look at, at these, at getting a movie written, you know, a screenplay written, a script written, and then also the, you know, actually doing the filming, you know, what is interesting to me is that everything's just, they talk about the three act structure. And so it sounds like that, you, you know, the, what is it? The setup, the confrontation, the resolution. And then, um, and then they even talk about on the scripts, you have to use a, a certain font and it's half an inch this. And, and so all this stuff that just constrains you, but you know, the thing is with you being the writer and the director, maybe you didn't have to go through all that, bullshit that a lot of people go through just to you know get their story put out there yeah that you you kind of hit something there you know when frankie was starting out in his ufc career right i'm sure uh, frank you attest to this maybe i'm wrong dude um was there people that you fought earlier on that had more let's just say higher ranking than you credentials than you were they were they second third fourth degree black belts in something where did they were they state champions were they national olympians when you had your training but their training on paper not fighting you but just training they they were farther along yeah more more accolades yeah absolutely right so here's the thing frankie went in there and fucked them up right so with me, I was fortunate enough in my career to have a lot of um, lead roles. So when you play in a lead in a movie, it's different than playing a main supporting or a supporting because um, you look at the script as, as an arc because everything revolves around you. It, it sounds so selfish. I, please don't think that that's what I'm saying. No, it's not no, that. but it's just- uh -huh. But they're yeah, called- the they're called of it. Yeah, they're called supporting characters because ultimately their characters support your journey from beginning to end. So playing leads, I, through the years, uh, I kind of understand it innately now how to tell that journey. There's things I look for when I see this world on paper and how to plan it out. It's like a timeline. So I never read a writing book. I never read a directing book. I don't, I, all I know is how to tell a story. So I, that's one of the reasons why too, 
I was going to invest and bet on myself for sons because I didn't know if this was work. There, there was no one, two, three act. There was no structure. I just knew at this time in the story, something's got to come here to make the audience go, what the fuck is happening right now? And that's going to happen early on because as an actor, I, I know to put that into my work early on in the story, playing a lead yes. to bring the audience in. So I also played with the concept of, and look, there's nothing wrong with reading books and, and knowing this inside and out, but if you know it, you know it, you know, and, um, you know, Frankie early on in his career was going against guys that were six degree black belts and this and that. The bottom line is Frankie knew how to whoop people's ass and he did. And then, yes, he climbed and got ranking as well. But there was just that's what he was built for. He was built to do that. And I feel like I was kind of built for playing, a, a, telling a, a character's journey and, you know, felt right to make the choice to direct it. So at the end of the movie, um, my big thing was I wanted to kind of dingle the carrot. Now, I didn't know if this was going to work. I don't know, I didn't know if people were gonna walk away from that movie and like Vincent. Mm-hmm. You know, what you do is- I liked Vincent. Thank you, Angel. <laughs> <laughs> I remember- I um, did too, I thought it was- uh, Yeah, I liked uh, Vincent a lot. Thanks. <laughs> That's pretty sick. <laughs> I, I played with it uh, in this movie, Bad Frank, years ago. Um, Tom Sizemore is so incredible in that movie, guys. You ever wanna see him? like? What is it called? Um, bad Frankie? Bad, bad Frank, yeah. Okay, <laughs> bad ironic, Frank. Right? That's yeah. ironic. Bad Frank <laughs> Edgar, it'll be the uh, the sequel. <laughs> um, so here's he was a he was a bad guy. You know, he did he did he was a violent bad guy. I'm not gonna give away any of the movie, but okay. ultimately he was such a monster playing the lead in that, because I rewrote the script, but playing the lead in it, I had to think about the vulnerability. Because ultimately. I, I was looking at the story and I'm like, are people going to like this guy? Are they going to want to keep watching the movie to the end to see what happens? And I remember at that time doing research on Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, my character was not that. No. But I remember something that triggered me. I saw an interview with Jeffrey Dahmer one time with his mom and dad, right? And this is where, you know, uh, my life lessons as an artist, uh, as a playing as an actor and then a writer, I remember his dad on a podium after all that shit was going on. And he was not sticking up for his son in any way, shape, or form. You know, he was, uh, a lot of stuff was unbeknownst to them. They were completely shocked. They don't stand behind him. They want nothing to do with this and that. And the very end of that interview, the very fucking end, he goes just like this. He said, but he's still my son and I love him. I knew you were going to say that. And when I, heard, when I saw that, <clears throat> my fucking light bulb went off because people go for the vulnerability. They go for the love. So with Vincent... If you think about, if you look at it on, on, if you look at the movie with no, um, no dialogue or no music or no sound, you see, and you know what's going on, you're like, he's, he's a bad man. It's the first thing, the first line of dialogue in the voiceover of the movie. The, line, the movie opens up, Vincent says, he's, I'm telling the audience, I'm not a good man. I'm telling you straight up. But when he starts talking about how he was raised by his dad, people's heartstrings get pulled a little bit. Yeah. When he gets, you know, when he gets double crossed by his own soon to be wife, you know, like all this stuff, like people will forgive the bad things if they if they hang on and associate with the good things. So I walked a fine line at the end of that movie with that last scene, Angel, like you were saying. Yes. Like, After yes. this, will people be like, oh, fuck this guy or. Well, you know. Yeah, exactly. I know exactly. the latter because you could actually what i like is you know i'm kind of into intellectual type stuff but it makes you think so i started thinking about it you know afterwards it 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 lingered with me for you know for a while after i watched it and it allowed me to reflect and so i thought it was you did a great job on that Oh man, thanks. I then thank you for saying that but but what i really love is is the fact that it, you know, your work reaches someone to the point where they're actually thinking about it. So thanks so much, man. That, that's, yeah, that's, but, yeah, that's exactly. but also what comes across is the whole movie is your sadness, the mm-hmm. sadness yeah. over your dad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, yeah. you, you feel your sadness, like you're sad, you're mad, but you're, you're, you're missing your dad. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Key moments that you put in the movie. Key moments. Yeah. Uh, you had me. I'm going to tell you when you had me at the movie. It was the stair. I'm not going to say whose stair, but it was the stair. Uh, at that moment, you knew something was up, but you had to okay. think about it. And you probably know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. And and because you dropped hints along the way. Yeah. It was like uh, I I I kind of said to James, it was like the mob meets Alfred Hitchcock. You know, it's like uh, you did put those uh, uh, those those hints in there. And. Uh-huh. Planting people scene. that just want to yes. watch yes. people running around shooting each other up, they're not going to pick up the hints. A real movie watcher, they're going to pick up the hints and they're going to enjoy the hints. And, uh, but Frankie, besides that, one other thing, why did you pick Frankie to do that very violent scene, if you know what I mean? Um, I needed to, well, one, I know, I know Frankie would want to do it, uh, <laughs> but um, I, I closed I, my eyes at that part. <laughs> so the, the, the story of the Bastard Sons is much bigger than the movie that you just watched. Um, people, it's been such a warming thing hearing like, is there going to be a sequel? Some people, I've heard that from so many, so many people. And then some people have even said this should be a series. And yeah, it could be. Um, I had to plant seeds right now on everybody. So there is this, uh, there is one thing I had in my mind when I was writing the script. And you know, and a lot of creative stuff goes on from writing to getting ready, directing, producing all that stuff. But this one thing I was so excited about, and that was the scene with um, Frankie and the, the Louisville slugger. What was important to me was not so much that, it, it, it was, but it was the reaction of, of everyone watching. And then at the a later scene with, I'll just say with my girlfriend, that was on my mind from day one when I was writing as well. Everyone's individual reaction is different. And it's different because that is a tale, a telling, a telling tale without smashing anyone in the face of it, that if and when there is a sequel, their response to that scene is what opens the door up to how they have reacted to that in the sequel. Because the sequel, if, if we do it, takes place three years later. And if you do that sequel, though, you're gonna bring you're gonna bring that character to a different level. I mean, yeah. a level you can you cannot you can never no longer say that character is good. You're gonna have to take that in a whole different direction. Uh do you see that or uh D- different direction. Well, I don't want to give too much. I, I really can't give anything away. But yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't I can say that the sequel um, is a much. I need a, a lot more money to do it. The way I want, without sacrificing my vision, it has to be a much longer movie. But given the response to this one, I'm not scared to cross the two hour mark with the sequel. I'm not scared to do that now. But the sequel scares me. Um, to be honest, not the weight of making the movie production wise. It's, it scares me because, and that's a good place to be as an artist, you know, it's, it's uncharted waters. So I'm not afraid to take that next step, but um, what, what my character will go through as an actor, I'm a little scared to ask actors to go through certain things, you know what I mean? But they're going to have to um really live that out you know when you're living out a part I, some of some of the best memories i have as an actor in the business are movies that you guys will never see the movies never got finished they did get finished and they got the worst distribution release ever they lost financing halfway through but moments that i've had as an actor moments are like a moment when you see your child take its first step and and those are the moments of fulfillment that i try to i try to have for myself whether I get hired as an actor or I'm creating my own thing. So I strive for those moments. And as a storyteller or director, I, 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 I'm going to ask and I need the other actors to go have those moments too. And they're not always the most fun things to go through. Sometimes shit sticks with you for a couple of days, you know, um, where your mind has to go and what goes through you. So the sequel, needless to say, is going to, um, if you thought the first one had a hook, Man. I'm looking forward to that. I told Frankie the other day in the car, and he was getting goosebumps, right, Frankie? Yeah, oh, yeah. No, yeah. it's good. It's good. It's got to happen. 
<laughs> yeah. So uh, time will tell, man. I, I need. I'm doing other. I'm, I'm directing another movie in October in Chicago called Dirty Hands, but uh, it'll be a little bit to get ready for the sequel. I want to make sure that I'm ready. So it's a lot of prep, a lot of time. The movie will be bigger. There'll be more characters. And um, yeah, it's, 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 it'll, be, it'll be pretty wild. What made you go from uh, L.A. to back to Jersey? L.A. sucks, Angel. I know, right? <laughs> I, know. I don't know how else to say it. Like, vi visiting is cool, but... <laughs> I left everything over here to go to LA. Like everyone else, I'm not no. Yeah. You know, I sold my cars, sold my shirts, sold everything to get money to go out. And I left my dad's business. And I was like, by hook or by crook, I'm gonna figure this out. So the first year I had out there, I I, I hit and I started booking a lot of work and TV and and I was like, wow, this is great. But coming from a family business, it's not eight hours a day. And even though I was working as an actor consistently that doesn't mean you're working every day. That just means you're working enough as an actor to just about pay the rent and some other bills. Right. But I had so much time on my hands and I'm like, this, I'm gonna learn this business inside and out. So I started learning how to produce a film with a, a smaller budget business model to not lose any quality. So the investors have more of a chance. You're basically mitigating the risk, you know, have more of a uh -huh. chance to make money than not. Because ultimately, not to go off topic, if you make two movies, and you make the same amount of the same movie. Um, if Lee makes the Bastard Sons, he does it for a million. If I make Bastard Sons, I do it for a lot less. At the old, at the end of the day, we both make the same movie. It's only going to sell for X amount of dollars. Right. If I want investors to come into my world. I'm going to say, look, I can make it for this much. If it's going to make a million dollars, Lee over there is going to break even. But if you come with me, at least I know I can make put money in your pocket and make it actual an actual investment and not just be like a dollar in a dream and you know be like you know the risks of being an investor i can't stand people say that shit so i want people to make money too it makes me feel good you know so um i think i went a little off topic there that i oh, that's fine. no that was great i was gonna jay we're gonna wind this down so i'm gonna say james why don't you ask the, your final question first then angel and then i'm gonna ask my final question and we'll close it out how's that guys yeah that sounds good james um, why don't you I don't... start yeah, I don't really have a, a question per se. I just want to say um, thank you for, for coming on, both of you. You know, for me, it's just fascinating, to, the business side of it. I have an MBA, so that's kind of my background is business. But, you know, just, you know, I've never been in the film industry. So it's just in, interesting to me, you know, to see what you've been able to succeed. And so through... Um, you know, it's not easy. And, and, and for me, you know, it was refreshing to see a, a actual movie of quality, you know, and, and what I've also noticed is we see all these documentaries and it's getting stale with documentaries and because of, you know, 2020 and COVID, all that stuff, there's a lot of documentaries made. And so it's nice to actually see a movie of quality with good acting, good story and everything. So I just commend you. And I, I know it's going to uh, do very well. And, you know, I can't wait for the sequel. Wow. Thanks, man. Yeah. Really thanks cool. much. Yeah. And I commend no you guys. CGI. No uh, CGI. I mean, it takes uh, no CGI. No, no. no. Yeah. Like, you know, are, it goes back to no, the yeah, Are no old actors that are at the very end of their, their strings and, <laughs> when you watch a movie, it's like, oh, that's I know I recognize him. I recognize him. Uh, I think that's one of the issues, too, because these movies are being made nowadays and they're putting people in just because of who they are. You mean yeah. Bruce Willis, the way they did that to him, that was just a shame to put him was, in where he wasn't uh, able to act. Yeah, they just had massive like oak tag size cue cards behind the camera, like one line at a time, so he could just mm -hmm. read it. They just they just really hoard him out. Yes, um, they did disgust but, me. Yeah, and it kind of was what it was, man. But thanks, James, and, and same to you yeah, and Lee and Angel too. You know, I, I podcast is a business, and I commend you guys and Frankie's doing it too for uh, for doing your thing. So I, I appreciate it. Well, yeah, I absolutely. have to say this. Um, I'm sorry. I don't. I very rarely share anything that uh we do on youtube on all my uh social media platforms but this is definitely uh going on all of them and uh 
and I have to say this too. I was a huge fan of Boom Boom Mancini's. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he's a wonderful guy. A what huge a fan of his. <laughs> Is that Boom Boom? She wants. Uh, she's trying to. No, you know, I'm I'm friends with Vinnie Paz, um, the Tasmanian, uh, you know, devil, and he said that Boom Boom is a really nice man. He really is really nice. He is. Yes. Yeah, he is, man. It's kind of, it's funny, man. Frankie and Boom Boom have a lot of similarities, like in the sport, the respect they have and everything, you know? Um, yeah. It's Frankie, cool. do you know him? I got this, you know, it's kind of funny. I got this, I, I read his book when his book came out uh, yeah. and uh, and I met someone that, that knew him and, and he hooked me up with him and we we ended up talking on the phone. So yeah, oh, I was a, nice. a big fan of Boom Boom nice. for sure. Nice. I, I wish you all the luck in the world with this movie uh, really so with much, everything Andrew. that you do you both of you were such nice men really really nice men and i'm going to share that. this everywhere yeah. and i did text my nephew and say something about frankie edgar uh, and he's oh. like nice <laughs> <laughs> very cool very cool awesome. thanks so thanks so much Angel. i really appreciate that that's, that's really yeah, nice. tell, tell your nephew to drop to, to drop to drop uh, with his face and fight Frankie instead. <laughs> he does. <laughs> I see he's got the, the Mayweather fight going. Yeah, he's got yeah, that right. coming Super Bowl right for, weekend. So. Yeah. yeah. Here's That's my final question. Weekend. One year from now, if I brought you guys back to this show, where do you want to be? One year from now, you're going to probably have to deal with Frankie's manager. He's going to get big sunglasses. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. This. Never, you never know, happened. Never happened. My manager. <laughs> I don't know. Go ahead, Frank. What do you think? Yeah, no, I'm I'm hoping, you know, I, I again I'm I'm novice to this movie business, but uh I'm hoping we're well on our way into doing part two. You know, I think uh Kevin's got a really good vision and uh I'm glad I, I get to be a part of it. So Kevin gave you the bug. Yeah, uh yeah, for sure, for sure. Um well, you, got you know, I, I think they spoiled me though. I don't know if everybody's gonna think that everybody on on the on the the set that was involved with this movie was so helpful and so gracious with you know their 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 tips and just tell me how things go. So again, I I don't know. It's gonna be tough to match that 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 crew. That's right. That's your first indie, man. I mean, indies. Um, there there's a thing about indies. It's it's a small family, and you can ask Frank his first time around. Like, he still keeps in touch with people. You know, tax Instagram yeah. stuff, and you 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 have like these small families. It was a small crew. We only had like eight people on crew that's it you know normally you go to a film set there's 30 40 50 people running around like chickens with their heads cut off and it's like you know i just got a, a really small team of warriors in new jersey that i took a lot of time to curate and meet and they're they're largely responsible for for this as well especially um well i mean i gotta throw some names out there lee if some real quick oh, go for it go for it i also don't want to discredit anyone if i forget someone's name i hate doing that but uh dobson the character of Dobson was played by my one of my best friends, Joe Cernio, and he also produced. And almost all the locations in the movie were through him. He did all that legwork. We got authentic locations, so the movie looked a lot bigger than what our budget was. And Joe Manella, the camera guy, he did everything himself. There was no camera team. He literally held the camera, lit everything himself. Mike Comptelli, Ray Llewellyn was our makeup girl. She did all the special effects on the guy's face and stuff. And that was amazing. Oh, wasn't it? Oh she my was, god! She, and she did the whole movie with a broken hand too. I mean, wow. <clears throat> so uh, Jeff Stewart, right hand man. He just he was producer. There's a lot of people involved. The editor Nick Larabier was incredible. <clears throat> Glenn Rodriguez, who um, essentially wrote this uh, another script 15 years ago. Did I tell you guys that story? Do you know about that? No. Yeah. Oh, The Bastard Sons was derived from a script written by a 17-year-old kid. And I auditioned when I was living in Jersey, then I moved to LA and came back. But I auditioned for this movie in 2007 or 8 down in Atlantic City area. And um, this kid gave me the part. And then he's like, hey, man, um, I got no money. So, <laughs> so we'll make it when I get it. I said, all right. So we kept in touch. I moved to LA. He moved to LA. We worked together on a couple of short films. Come back here, stayed in touch. And then when COVID hit, uh, there was no way I was just gonna like not work. So I started writing and I ended up writing three scripts in like six months. And the first one was Bastard Son. So I reached out to Glenn Rodriguez and I said, remember that script you wrote years ago? He's like, yeah. I said, well, let's, let's open it up. So we opened it up 
And you know, it was written by a 17 year old. It was, it was about five dudes that grew up together. There was a girlfriend involved. They did the petty stick up crimes. And then the girlfriend was like, you know, giving it to the one guy. So it was like that. It wasn't written for men. So, but the idea of these five guys that grew up together, that's where it all started. So I took a page one rewrite, put the idea of them being bastards in a crime family, and then we just went from there. So that's how wow. that's how Bastard Son started, like 15 years ago, really. Wow. I want to ask you one question, too. Uh, where was the um, the cabin filmed? What area is that? That was in uh, Lake Ariel in the, the Poconos. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Right up there by Marla. Uh, Angel's partner, Marla, is from the Poconos. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, we should have the Poconos. Yeah. Shout out to the Poconos. Uh, yeah. And then the Red Rose Bakery and Tom's River, um, Freehold Towing. Those guys are great. Right, Frank? They had a big forklift yeah. in the back. They were they were building a set for us with a forklift and moving all these cars. And that red car that came out, yeah. uh, that, that character a guy was sitting in, that was on their lot. So they filled wow. the tire up, shined it up. The car was dead. And they just planted it. So the guy that played Guy uh, Lee, you might be interested in this. His name's Chuck McLean. He's a friend of mine. He is the creator of City on a Hill. Oh, really? He's, wow. He's a character and a half. He's a That's a great character. series. Yeah. So he created it. He cast Amanda. I met him. I ended up being on City on a Hill. Chuck's a character and a half. He's funny as hell. He's one of Hollywood's biggest writers. And this is his first acting role. He played Guy. And you got him in. For your shit. Right. Gentlemen, I like to say, Kevin, thank you so much for coming here. And I'm going to, uh, Angel and I, we're going to do some, uh, uh, I'll get a hold of you about other stuff. We're still filming. I don't want to talk about it right now, but uh, about, uh, about Angel wants to um, interview you. Okay. okay. Great. And, uh, thank you. And Frankie, I know you probably got a very busy schedule and thank you so much. Uh, I watched you, my, uh, since the beginning of time. I don't want to know. bother Kevin. We just did a whole full interview with him. Angel, Angel, we're still, we're still, <laughs> we're still taping. But I don't want to bother like, Angel and I talk every day. We fight like, <laughs> like, we're, 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 like we're married. I don't okay? want to bother okay. him. Okay. Put your robe back on and, 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 and go over by the, and go make me some coffee. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. I always wanted to tell John Gotti's daughter, go go get me some coffee. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it's an honor, Frankie. It means a lot to me. I mean, you, you know, if you got, if I'm going to speak to ten UFC fighters, you would be in that list. Uh, uh, thank you for that, and, and uh, re it's really much appreciated, gentlemen. With that, I'm going to end the recording. If you want to hang out for one minute, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you yeah, so thank much. You guys. Thank you. It was a pleasure. People, I'm going to have everything. Pleasure. Have everything. All the information is going to be underneath this video uh, on everything. I'm going to put a bunch of links under here for Frankie, for Kevin, and uh, even for Angel.